Your lecturer is Hans Friedrich Mueller. Dr. Mueller is the Thomas Lamont Professor of Ancient and Modern Literature at Union College. He is the editor of an abridged edition of Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The following lectures contain mature content that might not be suitable to some audiences. Viewer or listener discretion is advised. Welcome, students of ancient religion and disciples of ancient cult practices. My name, through no fault of my own, it was applied to me at birth on November 14, 1959, in Columbus, Ohio, USA, is Hans Friedrich Otto Mueller. I'm also known to former Latin students as Molinarios and to Greek students as Melonikos. Mula, in the original German, Molinarius and Melonikos all mean Miller, and I am indeed descended on my father's side from grain merchants, but on my mother's side from Scottish school teachers and Episcopalian priests. My father sold office furniture, I sell dead languages and teach ancient cultures. What are my qualifications, you ask? I see that my students are both inquisitive and particular. I respect that. After graduating from Whitefish Bay High School, I attended Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. But truth be told, after two years, I dropped out. Long story. I worked as a security guard, but when I discovered that after memorizing all of Latin grammar, I still couldn't read Caesar, I decided that maybe I did need college after all. So I enrolled at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where I earned BAs in German and Classics. Classics or classical philology is the study primarily of Greek and Latin, but also more generally of ancient Mediterranean literature, religion, archaeology, and history. Two BAs and teaching certification in hand, I taught high school Latin and German for six years in Clearwater, Florida, and earned an MA in classics from the University of Florida. Next stop was Chapel Hill, North Carolina for a PhD in Classics at UNC, where, in 1994, I finished a dissertation on pre-Christian Roman religion in the age of the Emperor Tiberius. Subsequent stops included the Bavarian Academy of Sciences in Munich, the Florida State University in Tallahassee, the University of Florida in Gainesville, and, for the last 15 years, Union College in Schenectady, New York. In short, I've been working in the areas of classics and ancient religion for a long time. And I'm excited to have this opportunity to reach a wider audience. So again, thank you for asking, and welcome, dear students of ancient religions. Although this course will focus on the classical Mediterranean religions of Greece and Rome, we put those religions in their wider cultural context. And thus we begin with Mesopotamia, Egypt, and ancient India, whose religions either directly influenced later Greco-Roman developments, or in the case of ancient India, shared a common linguistic and religious inheritance, which, divergent as the subsequent paths of their religious trajectories may have been, offers fascinating parallels and comparative evidence. We also look from time to time at Celts, Germans, and Persians. As Rome grew to encompass the entire Mediterranean, these diverse peoples and their religious traditions came to inhabit, thanks to Rome's aggressive warfare, a shared cultural space. We will trace some of the oddities that resulted. Mithras, for example, will find his way from Persia, or perhaps India, to Rome and beyond. Egyptian gods will find their way to Britain, and the god of ancient Israel will, in the shape of a new religion, eventually come to conquer the entire Roman Empire and thus extinguish all the many gods and diverse traditions within it. This story, too, the end of Mediterranean paganism, will be part of our story. How to begin? We live in an industrialized world, most of us live in cities, 
Loud, electrified, concrete, glass, asphalt, cars, carpets, plastic. I live in the United States. I was born in Columbus, Ohio, raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, lived in the South for 20 years, and migrated to upstate New York some 15 years ago. I have seen bits and pieces of the larger world, from Australia to Greece, from Mexico City to Istanbul. I also know that desolated landscapes still exist. I've seen our western deserts, I've hiked through forests, I've seen picturesque villages and cities overseas where pedestrians can still navigate the landscape in relative security. Nevertheless, I submit the world where most of us live most of the time is dominated by machinery and noise. Nature is often hard to see and very hard to hear. If it is difficult to imagine living in the pre-industrialized world, and I often marvel at paintings of cities and landscapes from past worlds without cars, how much more difficult might it be to imagine a world full of gods? This is not to say that we do not possess portals to fabulous worlds. We have screens everywhere, in our pockets and on our desktops, from our homes to public spaces, bars, restaurants, and the gas pumps where we fill our cars. Images, voices, music beckon everywhere, and it is increasingly difficult to turn away. Now, imagine a world where machinery neither hums nor roars, where the endless world that we view through screens instead live around us in the world through which we traverse, where every tree, every door hinge can house a god, where the calls of birds before dawn communicate divine messages, where an earthquake or plague signifies divine anger, where the misshapen liver of a barnyard animal reveals in code hints about the future, a world where gods visit us in our dreams or perhaps even in person, but in disguise. This is a world where the gods, and there are many of them, live in close and intimate contact with us, a world where the whole face of nature can convey messages from gods whose presence is felt in the powers that they manifest, in lightning bolts or fire, for example, or the shades of the dead who can speak to us in dreams. This world is not our world, but the ancient pagan world, which we are about to enter and explore. But first, a word about the word pagan. Pagan is a derogative term invented by Christians to, to disparage polytheistic adversaries. Pagan derives from the Latin word pagus, or countryside. A paganus, or feminine pagana, was someone who lived in a rural district, not in the city where Christianity first flourished. For an urban Christian to call a non-Christian pagan was the equivalent of calling someone a rustic, a yokel, peasant, hillbilly, rube. It was never meant as a compliment. Heathen, which derives from heath or uncultivated land in the countryside, shows similar prejudice. At least idolator or worshiper of images is descriptive. What then, you ask, my dear students, should we call these people if we don't wish to hurl insults across the millennia at practitioners of long vanquished religious traditions? What did they call themselves? They did not have a name for themselves. They were simply religious, pious, reverent, or, if especially so, perhaps even superstitious. They practiced their ancestral faiths. They had no need for a name. Their religion was woven into all aspects of their daily lives as their gods were everywhere all the time. It was no easy thing to extirpate utterly ancient religious traditions. Think of most families. You, my disciples of antiquity, may feel curious about or even comfortable with other religions. Some of you may even have abandoned your ancestral faith. But how frequent is conversion even in our day? Conversion tends to elicit strong resistance from family members. Personally, I was raised as a Lutheran. When my Roman Catholic fiancé and I announced our engagement, family members on both sides objected. Some threatened boycotts. 
Outsiders, on the other hand, would have had trouble distinguishing between Lutheranism and Catholicism. Ancient peoples did not surrender without a fight, and understanding the depth and strength of their religion will help us understand better the profoundly transformative results of Christian conquest. But we still have a long way to go. Let us begin by defining what we count as religion for the purposes of this course. Human efforts to identify, understand, worship, cultivate supernatural forces will count as religious activity. Such belief systems will be embedded in daily activities of individuals and have important roles in social organization as well. We will count as religious worship and reciprocal relationships between humans and gods. We will count as magic human attempts to compel gods or nature to obey human commands and desires. If I vow, for example, to sacrifice a chicken to Asclepius, provided he cures my ailment, I make an offer to a supernatural being, which he is free to reject. This is reciprocal, and we will count it as religious. If instead I seek to heal my heart by compelling my neighbor's wife to fall in love with me by means of spells, this is magic. If I seek medicine for my heartache, the word in Greek is pharmakos, the source of our word pharmacy, perhaps I look for a physician. Religion and magic are also closely related to medicine, which is, of course, another healing art. However, pharmakos can also mean potion or poison. What if I seek a love filter to administer to my love interest, and I recite a spell, and I make a vow to Aphrodite? Medicine, magic, and religion are sometimes difficult to distinguish. Where to begin? Let us begin at an age where there are no written records, the Stone Age. Archaeologists infer religion from certain human practices, burial of the dead, for example. We do not know what words were said, nor do we know to what gods, if any, the dead were entrusted. But we do have organized human remains, and these remains tell us that people cared for the deceased. Some were buried whole. Some were buried as ashes and bones after cremation. Archaeologists have found grave goods, too. Jewelry, weaponry. Do these things represent equipment for the deceased in the next world? We can speculate, but no contemporary texts explain to us precisely what we look at. Other objects, too, tell a story. Or perhaps they don't. The Venus of Willendorf, discovered in 1908 in Austria, is perhaps more than 20,000 years old. This carved limestone figurine depicts an obese woman with overlarge buttocks and breasts. Is she a fertility goddess? Call me a skeptic, but I hesitate to judge unless we have texts to tell us what she meant in language that uses words. I reveal my prejudices. I prefer linguistic evidence. Even then, of course, we can't accept any testimony wholesale. Texts, like the rest of us, can and often do lie, whether by omission or commission or simple ignorance. And we haven't even addressed the deficiencies of the interpreter, who may be removed by time, space, language, culture, history, and religious outlook from the witness borne by any given testimony. Our detective work may be challenging, dear students, so let us reflect for a moment on this Stone Age Venus of Willendorf, a name that calls to mind both the charms and graces of Rome's Venus and the rustic pastures of Germanic lands north of the Alps. If our own descendants, some 20,000 years from now, should find a miraculously preserved Barbie doll, with her unnaturally narrow waist combined with overlarge hips and breasts, would they be justified in calling her the Venus of El Segundo, California? 
Skepticism aside, our researchers have already uncovered two themes that will haunt us throughout this course. Death and sex both present existential challenges and both express what to a mind schooled in current monotheistic traditions might consider disproportionate themes. Death perhaps we can accept, but celebrations of sex. Our culture has farmed out the celebration of sex to the entertainment industries. Our religious systems tend to promote abstinence from such indulgence. To find such celebrations in a religious context, BCE. The Hebrews did not settle Palestine until the 1200s, and the House of David did not rule till the 900s BCE. 
The Hebrew Bible is early modern in comparison with these texts. And the Greeks and Romans, even closer to the present. We run roughshod over an array of civilizations. These empires rose and fell over millennia. But I hasten to introduce a text, the Enuma Elish, which tells the story of creation and will serve to introduce us to the mythology and religion of Mesopotamia, a tradition that offers striking parallels with later mythologies and thus seems to have exerted a strong influence on them. Our text derives from the library of the Assyrian king Ashur Banipal, who reigned from 668 to 627 BCE. His library in Nineveh collected large numbers of religious texts in the shape of clay tablets, written in cuneiform. Upon the collapse of his empire, the library was buried in the sands until it was uncovered by modern archaeologists. These texts include such stories as the creation epic, the epic of Gilgamesh, the earliest account of the flood, more famous in the later version featuring Noah, and the descent of Ishtar into hell, as well as liturgies, prayers, hymns, chants to be sung at various festivals, ritual texts, incantations and spells, omen texts, astrological texts, and instructions for divination, which allow priests, for example, to interpret the flight of birds, the appearance of livers in animals that have been sacrificed, or strange celestial phenomena. We could easily fill all the lectures allotted to this course with these materials alone. But let us return to the Epic of Creation, or Enuma Elish. I shall summarize. In the beginning, there was water, Tiamat, salt water, and her male counterpart, Apsu, fresh water. Tiamat was supreme. Their son was Mumu. Next arose their son Anshar and their daughter Kishar, who in turn begot a son, Anu, who became the supreme god. Anu had a son, Ea, who was wiser than all the gods up to this point. The younger gods enjoyed ruddy times together. The older gods, including Tiamat, could not sleep. The young gods would not listen to Apsu, who suggested that they keep quiet. Apsu and Apsu's son, Mumu, argued that they, together with Tiamat, should destroy the rowdy younger gods. The plot was no secret, so Ea, the wisest god, created a magic circle to protect the younger gods, and Ea used a magic spell to render Apsu and Mumu defenseless. Ea killed Apsu and led Mumu around by a rope that he had placed through Mumu's nose. Ea then begot Marduk, who was superior to all other gods. Meanwhile, Anu kicked up some winds, disturbing Tiamat's waters. She became angry once again. Kingu, one of her children, again proposed destroying the disruptive gods, adding to their argument the need to revenge Apsu and Mumu. Tiamat agreed, and she created monsters and gave Kingu the Tablets of Destiny, that is, the power of Anu. Let us reflect for a moment. Much of the struggles we observe in this story revolve around who will be in charge? Who will set the decrees, control destiny? Who will be the boss? A perennial question. We could pause here and read the myth at this simple level. The myth mirrors humans' concerns. Humans struggle for power. The gods struggle for power. Human families do not get along. The gods do not get along. Or on a societal level, we see a political struggle for power. One group or one people versus others and their leaders. There is obviously a gender dimension. The leader of one group is female and that of the other male. We neglect nature. We hear much of raging waters and winds. The gods are the air, the sun, the earth. 
perhaps we're dealing merely with metaphors for nature and storm. But let's not get ahead of ourselves as we rejoin the story. Ia informs his father and his grandfather, Anchar, that Tiamat, Kingu, and company are plotting the destruction of the younger gods. Ia and his father, Anu, are too scared to face Tiamat and Kingu. Marduk is then elected supreme commander in an assembly of the gods. Why do the gods elect Marduk? Marduk demonstrates his powers through magic. The gods say, and now I quote, Lord, truly thy decree is first among gods. Say but to wreck or create it shall be. Open thy mouth, the cloth will vanish. Speak again, and the cloth shall be whole. At the word of his mouth, the cloth vanishes. He speaks again, and the cloth is restored. When the gods, his fathers, see the fruit of his word, joyfully they do homage, and they say, Marduk is king. Marduk then receives scepter, throne, and vestment. That is, the symbols of power as well as matchless weapons. Marduk captures Tiamat with a net, uses herbs to resist her poison, and utilizes lightning to immobilize her. He harnesses winds to his chariot to face the monsters, places a halo on his head, smears his lips with red lipstick, a magical protection, and calls on his magic weapon, the thunderstorm. Kingu is terrified by Marduk's brilliance. Marduk scolds Tiamat for not loving her children, and Marduk attacks, quote, When Tiamat opens her mouth to consume him, he drives in the evil wind so that she cannot close her lips. As the fierce winds charge her belly, her body distends and her mouth is wide open. He releases the arrow. It tears her belly. It cuts through her inside, splitting her heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguishes her life. He casts down her carcass to stand upon it. After he has slain Tiamat, the leader, her band is shattered, her troop broken up, and the gods, her helpers, who marched at her side, he makes them captives. A male god takes the place of a supreme female goddess. This may well reflect the displacement of a supreme goddess by a male usurper. It may also represent a paradigm for earthly gender relations. It is certainly violent. Let us return to the epic. Marduk tramples on the demons and takes the tablets of destiny and fastens them on his own chest. He mutilates Tiamat's body to create the earth, sky, and rivers. Quote, The Lord treads on the legs of Tiamat with his unsparing mace. He crushes her skull. When the arteries of her blood he has severed, the north wind bears it to places undisclosed. On seeing this, his fathers are joyful and jubilant. They bring gifts of homage to him. Then the Lord pauses to view her dead body, that he may divide the monster and do artful works. He splits her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he sets up as the sky. Marduk organizes the universe, distributes tasks to his followers. He turns demons into statues as memorials and warnings to those who would revolt. Marduk then turns to the creation of a temple to provide the gods with all their needs, Babylon. Ea suggests killing Kingu and using his blood to make slaves for the gods. Blood will I mass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage. Human shall be their name. Verily, savage humans I will create. They shall be charged with service to the gods, so that gods may be at ease. The temple Babylon is completed. The gods gathered within its walls celebrate. They receive the rites of religious worship and incense. We discover that the purpose of human beings is to worship the gods. But, we may ask, do gods truly benefit from human services? 
The Babylonians seem to have thought so, as would many other traditionally religious peoples around the Mediterranean. Socrates and Plato will beg to differ. We will return to this topic. But for now, let us return to the epic. Marduk puts an end to the chaos of Tiamat, whose salt waters were originally mingled with the fresh waters of Apsu, that is, chaotically. Marduk has killed, cut, divided, and organized her parts. Her chaos is replaced by the order of Marduk. The simplest way to read this myth is that chaos, disorder, yields to cosmos, order. The identification of the female gender with disorder and the male with order is another pattern that will turn up again from time to time. The Enuma Elish is also a classic example of succession myth. One generation of gods supplants or succeeds the previous generation. We will see this again in the Greek poet Hesiod's Theogony, or Birth of the Gods. Eventually, Marduk emerges as the supreme god. The Enuma Elish is also an ideological myth. That is, it explains the aetios in Greek, which is to say the reason or cause of something. It explains the origin of the world, the divine hierarchy, the reason and purpose of human life, and the origins and purpose of religious worship. This epic of creation was also part of an autumn festival of the new year that lasted 12 days. The Enuma Elish was read during this festival, during which the high priest also stripped the king of his royal insignia. The king was slapped in the face, his ears were pulled, and he was made to kneel before Marduk. After this, his royal insignia were restored. If the slap made the king cry, Marduk was propitious. The king was then once more vested with his royal authority. In its own time, the Enuma Elish was thus a text that helped establish a religious context for the Babylonian state and its system. This creation epic explains the origin of the world, its organization, and humanity's place in it, and it provides an effective pattern by which to combat evil forces. Society, whether divine or human, selects a strong man, a divine king like Marduk. The king becomes the representative of Marduk. All human beings will have their place in the social hierarchy, just as all gods have theirs. It all depends on who controls destiny, that is, who has the tablets. By the time the Greeks enter history, Mesopotamian religious culture has already long been a common inheritance of the Mediterranean. Although, as tends to happen when cultures borrow from each other, the culture that borrows adapts what it takes for its own purposes. For our own purposes, let us draw a first lesson. A text that may be read purely as a story, as myth, enjoyed deeper connections to the religion, rituals, and politics of the society from which it derives. These connections become clearer in historical context. To trace pagan religions will require us to keep track of history, at least to the extent that historical facts are available to us. Alas, we are out of time, dear students of ancient religions and cult practices. But when you return, we will visit ancient India, which enjoyed a long history indeed. Alas, that history is obscure. What connects India to the Mediterranean, especially to Greece and Rome, is a shared linguistic heritage. Sanskrit, the language of ancient India, is closely related to Greek and Latin. And hidden in the words these languages share are common religious conceptions as well. We have a lot to discuss. But until then, may your studies as well as your nights and days be auspicious.